is Jack Self. I'm an architect and uh, a publisher or editor. Um, this question of the changing nature of time in contemporary society is probably one of the most urgent questions. So I, I really love this subject a lot. Um, and I wanted to give a kind of brief history of modern time and then some reflections on uh, a period of transition, which I think we're in today. Modern time really begins probably sometime in the 1100s. At, at that moment, there were a bunch of religious figures, uh, monks, who were concerned as to why Jesus had not come back. Um, he said he was going to come back. He hadn't turned up. Why was that the case? Some of them felt maybe it's because we weren't living right. Uh, maybe the conditions weren't appropriate for him to return. And so they started thinking about ways that they could create a, a global society uh, in order for Jesus to want to return. There were a number of ideas. Some said we should become missionaries. We should go and convert parts of the world which aren't Christian. Um, we should uh, perhaps uh, focus on um, the way in which we're practicing our religious ceremonies. And then some monks said, well, maybe the problem is that we're only actually showing devotion to God uh, during our liturgical services inside our churches. Maybe since God is everywhere, maybe actually everything we do is an act in the service of God. And that suddenly meant that plowing a field or writing a illuminated manuscript had the same value. The way that you made a bed, the way that you prepared a meal, suddenly all of these things were important as um, uh, in the service of God. Uh, this continued for a little while until some other monks said, well, how actually can we maximize this? How can we uh, do more in the service of God? They recognized that some days they could plow a certain number of fields and other days they could plow a different number. And they thought that more was better, but they didn't know how to measure this because at that time, uh, the structure of time was still based on a Roman system in Western Europe, uh, which was the division of the day into 12 hours of light and 12 hours of dark. These hours varied throughout the year, according to uh, the equinox and solstice, which meant that, for example, in, in the UK, an hour during the winter might be just 40 something minutes, whereas during the summer, it could be 70 plus minutes. Um, this gave them no regular standard. For some time, German monks had been experimenting with water clocks as a way to create a kind of universal concept of time. And this really took off with one monk being charged with watching the water clock and ringing bells so that everyone knew when particular activities were supposed to take place. And this allowed them to start to invent the concept of productivity. Uh, about the same time, there was an interest in the division of labor. Um, it's okay if I make a whole book myself and then write it and bind it, but maybe they thought if one of us is making the paper and one of us is making the ink and one of us is writing the book, we might make more books that way. This continued. Uh, they started to put clocks everywhere. It wasn't just the monasteries now that had to be regulated by this system of time. There was an attempt to get all of society to follow such a structure. And by the 1500s, uh, monasteries were very well regulated in terms of their concept of a universal time, which was separate from uh, you know, all forms of agricultural time, and which were driven by these ideas of, of uh, productivity and maximizing your um, work in the service of God. Henry VIII came along and basically said, I want all the power and wealth of the monasteries, so convert to Protestantism or I'll kill you. Uh, a lot of them refused, so they were either killed or they were kicked out of their monasteries, which were uh, demolished. And these monks and nuns didn't really know what to do. Um, they started to form new types of communities, which they called companies. And some of the oldest mercantile and capitalist companies in the world uh, date back to uh, this period of the Reformation. Uh, I mean, Barclays is a very good example. Um, these monks and nuns became basically merchants uh, and they kept doing what they had done before, which was maximizing productivity, maximizing profit, attempting to standardize systems of time so that they could improve the measurement 
uh, of what it was that they were doing. And this really took off. I mean, we can, we can pretty much cruise through the next couple of hundred years. Uh, eventually, someone thought about putting the water clocks uh, at a really big scale, and we ended up with water wheels that powered mills. Uh, agricultural workers who had absolutely zero concept of this idea of structured time were uh, encouraged or forced into working in factory conditions. Um, the idea of arriving at a particular place at a particular time would have been an extremely foreign concept for agricultural workers of the 16, 1700s. Uh, and then we start to see things really accelerate with the invention of colonialism, imperialism, and slavery. We think of the cotton mills of Manchester in the 19th century. And of course, where does that cotton come from? And the slave, in a sense, is the perfect uh, a capitalist um, entity because they have almost no cost associated with them and you can control them completely in terms of how they work within your order and structure of time. This logic of arrangement and organization of activity uh, began to produce ideologies or justifications for it. We start to see around this time in the 16, 1700s, uh, the invention of the scientific method, um, which basically says that you can start from nothing and you can always end up with something which is better and more accurate and more precise than you had before. Uh, we start to see ideas of economics, which talk about linear, cumulative, exhaustive time, the extraction of resources, their fabrication into products, and then the sale of those products. But all of the technologies which were invented in order to support this um, desire to make more uh, were at this point um, achieving economies of scale. So they were standardized. And of course, if you have a standardized, homogenized production method and logic of the structure of time, you also have to have a homogenized, standardized structure of society. So people uh, are increasingly pushed towards occupying highly specific functional roles within this uh, structure of society. Uh, this pretty much leads us up to the early uh, 21st century. And after the financial crash, it became evident that this concept of modern time, which uh, has the assumption underneath it that every generation will be wealthier, will be better educated, will be more equal, more just, uh, there's not just a kind of technological and economic progress which occurs in a linear and singular direction, but that uh, we also become morally better uh, as a society and as individuals with each passing generation. This began to become quite seriously questioned. And there were a number of reasons for this. I think one of the first triggers was a recognition or understanding of how debt economies function. Um, after the early 1980s, this uh, desire to produce more and more uh, was subtly uh, shifted towards an idea of um, uh, being able to afford to buy more through uh, debt, through the extension of debt to the general populace. And debt, after all, is the sale of future labor. So what it says is, in order for you to pay off your mortgage, you need to keep things pretty much exactly the same for the next 30 years. And I think more and more people began to think, that this sale of the future uh, and that their promises about keeping the future the same as it was today became increasingly uh, unacceptable. Um, maybe another aspect which uh, began to call into question this idea of linear, cumulative, uh, modern uh, time um, was the civil rights movements, which came on the back of 2008. Um, I'm thinking first perhaps of Occupy, uh, but one can look at Black Lives Matter, hashtag Me Too, uh, Extinction Rebellion. There's, there's a number of, of uh, contemporary civil rights movements. And although they've all emerged out of needs of the present, they all talk about injustices and inequalities today. Actually, their main function in society has been to reconfigure our relationship with the past. Previously, it was possible for conservatives to say, the past was pretty good and uh, you know, tradition is, is a valuable thing and we should try and keep society today the way it was before or we should try and get back to how it was before, that the changes we've somehow made have been a mistake. It's almost impossible to make that argument today uh, uh, it, unless you look like me 
the past was not a, a pleasant place and it was not a place which is in any way desirable. And this lack of desirability for the past um, uh, is a kind of a, a, an increasing dimension of, of our reconfiguration of time. I mentioned briefly Extinction Rebellion. It's important to mention as well the climate crisis. As uh, climate change, global warming became unavoidable uh, in terms of its material effects, its visible effects, we began to realize that unless we transition to a society which has a not an exhaustive, not a linear, not a cumulative form of time, but a circular, a regenerative, a restorative uh, concept of, of uh, relationship with time and, and the material world, then our species will uh, go extinct. So there's an existential question around our relationship with the structure of time. Um, and if we add one perhaps final dimension to this, which is the anxiety about the future, uh, the pandemic has, irrespective of where you are, um, called into question our uh, Im imaginary for what the future can be. And I think it's very clear today that we are in what I would call a new renaissance. Um, this might sound like a, a very grand statement, but you know, what was the renaissance? The renaissance was not an endpoint. It was not an objective. It was a transitional phase. No one who lived during the Renaissance called it that. It was not invented as a term until the late 19th century. What they thought was going on uh, was a reconfiguration of their relationship with time. That's what I would argue. And, and what the Renaissance was, was a transition between the medieval and modernity, in as much as we are now seeing exactly the same, which is we've, we've exited modernity. Uh, I think very few people in their heart of hearts believe in this concept of linear, uh, cumulative, exhaustive time. Um, and therefore, we're in a period which will probably last 100 years, uh, in which we have to work out um, as individuals, as a global society, how we will structure uh, our concept of time, and therefore what type of society uh, will emerge from that. Um, I'm quite optimistic about it on the whole. Uh, this anxiety around a lack of future is true, but it was a vision of the future that was untenable and unsustainable and impossible. And in fact, in that sense, undesirable. Uh, and therefore the, the openness of the future today is for me uh, a really incredible uh, condition. And I think that's probably all I really have to say about our transition to this uh, new structure of time. Thank you.